a lot of it is the showing up. I say to the I say to the leadership team that reports directly to me, I want you to find time to show up. I want you to find time to speak up, and I want you to find time to shut up. This is a new angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is all about creativity and hustle happening in and around the great state of Montana. Today's episode features my conversation with Eric Sprunk, probably one of the proudest graduates of the University of Montana. He's a 1986 grad, and he was back in town to deliver the address at commencement, a tremendous honor, and you could just see how excited he was about the opportunity to do that. The speech was awesome, tight, from the heart, delivered in such a way that students could relate to it. It had a great mix of humility and inspiration and uh, also some serious gravity to it as well. So we got into some of those themes today. We got into his leadership philosophy, understanding how he goes about doing his work in such a way that he tries to empower people to do their best work. That was a really interesting part of the conversation. And we also got into the notion of making decisions in your life that create the biggest, um, the, you know, the largest amount of opportunity for you. So some great advice is for, you know, for young people or for any of us really trying to chart a path in our career. So great to talk to Eric. What also emerged too is, is a real theme between last week's episode with Jeff Ament and this week with Eric. I mean, these two guys are operating at the highest level of their respective worlds. And you could see that this town, this community, Missoula, keeps them grounded in a really special way. And, and um, that really came through in the conversations. So anyway, super fun conversation with Eric. We thank uh, him for his time, his insight, and most of all, his dedication to the University of Montana. And now I give you Eric Sprunk. Eric, thanks for coming on the podcast. You bet. Happy to be here. So Eric, you are perhaps our most uh, vociferous and most prominent alumnus. I don't know if that's a distinction you've aspired to, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment, nonetheless. Yeah, welcome back to campus. Uh, you're here for a great honor, and that's to be the commencement speaker yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, I'm excited about that. And you get to do it twice. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if I'm excited about that part of it, but I am I, I, it, I am honored, and I am I'm actually looking forward to it. I think it's going to be good fun. So anyway, Eric, you've been so generous with your time and your dedication to this institution, both through your, your, your giving, but also through just the time and you speak in classes and you engage with students. And so it's just great to have you on campus and to, to sort of share your wisdom to the entire uh, college community. So thanks. Thank you for, thanks for being here. Hopefully it's wisdom. I think most of the time it's at least interesting perspective for the students. So I enjoy sharing it with them. I think it is. And you know, I've heard you talk about this before. You've talked about how the uni your University of Montana education sort of gave you a great foundation to go and do great things. Yep. But I'd like to yep. kind of get into the mechanics of that. How specifically okay. like, did it enable you to go on and do great things? I know you started out in public accounting and we we'll maybe get through some of that, but yep. um, your time here, why was that special for you? Yeah. You know, part of it is because I grew up here. So I, I didn't go to school here my freshman year. I went to uh, Linfield College okay. in Oregon my freshman year and realized that I uh, that I wanted to go back home, be at the University of Montana. I have a you know I love this place. Yeah. Uh, and Missoula is a special place to me. It's my home. Mm -hmm. It's my hometown. Hellgate High School. Hellgate High School, Rattlesnake yeah. Grade School. Yeah, I lived up the snake uh, as a kid. Um, yeah, so I so it's meant a great deal to me, and it was um, it was a place that my uh, that my you know, my parents were still lived here. We're doing business here. My dad was a car dealer. Mm -hmm. My mom was a realtor at Lambros Realty at the time. I watched her graduate in 1984. I graduated in 1986. Okay. So it was, it was fun to go to school in my hometown. Uh, and that meant a lot to me. What, what it provided me is unbelievable opportunity. You know, a lot of my friends are still in Missoula. They're, they're my friends from grade school, sure. high school, the university. And I, I always viewed my uh, education and my degree um, as an opportunity to think about what I could do with my life, okay. uh, which, which meant I could stay in Missoula because I had, I had two really good job offers to stay in Missoula. Yeah. But I also had a couple of job offers with what was at the time big eight accounting firms. And, and it was always home-based to me. So I always figured, hey, if I, le if I left... And, then, and I didn't enjoy it, much like my freshman year of college, I can always come back. Sure. So it was always home base. And so I, so I always tried to make the decision 
that provided me the most opportunity. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take the job at Pricewaterhouse. I'm going to move to Portland uh, because if it doesn't go well, I can come back to Missoula and I can live happily ever after. And and I kind of approached my career in that way. And it was because I, I always felt like I had a home base and home base was literally home, which I think is somewhat unique for a lot of students. Yeah. And so when you're thinking about like making the choice that creates the most opportunity, yep. yeah, obviously, hey, I could go to Portland. I could come back here. What was it about, you know, choosing accounting that sort of made you think that maybe this will open some doors and provide opportunity? Uh, that's a good question. My I had entered college wanting to get an accounting degree. Okay. I loved accounting class in high school. Oh, so you I, took I, it at Hellgate. I, I took it at Hellgate. Okay. I had two years of, uh, of principles of accounting. Um, and I just, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a left brainer. I'm numerically inclined. I uh-huh. really liked the, the analytic part of it and work with numbers. And, and I was going to be a corporate tax attorney. That's yeah. why I was going to get my accounting degree. Then I was going to go to law school and I was going to become a corporate tax attorney. I have no idea why in my head. I, I wanted to do that. I don't. I, I I didn't have an uncle. I didn't have a sure, father. Sure. I don't remember some TV show being that instrumental in my life. But that was kind of my plan. And I and frankly, I so that I set off to do that. I loved the accounting program here. Mm-hmm. I loved being in the business school. Uh, I think it's a great grounding. Accounting is a great grounding for a lot of things. I I'm I'm super partial, but I tell a lot of kids if you have a chance to go through accounting, you should do it. Because you could always end up being a certified public accountant or an accountant, or you can work in finance, or you can work in marketing, or you yeah. can work in uh, in economics, or you can work in statistics. But if you don't have an accounting degree and you just have a finance degree or you have a, a marketing degree, you can never be an accountant. So it seemed like it was the one. Yeah, that makes sense. That provided the the largest breadth of potential opportunities, and it was something that I loved. So that's that's kind of how I got started in accounting. Okay, so then you go to Price Waterhouse. Yeah, Price Waterhouse in Portland. In Portland, and you're there what eight, nine years? Seven, or, a little over in between seven and eight years. And Nike's yep. your top client at that point. Nike is my uh, is my favorite client for sure. Yep, yep. and my biggest client. Okay. Yep. And so, uh, how's this opportunity sort of come about that you get asked to sort <laughs> of you know cross the street over to Nike? Yeah, you know, a lot of times in public accounting, your clients, uh, you know, they're trying to find the accounting managers sure. or controllers or financial reporting analysts. And I had been approached a couple of different times, but I loved working for Pricewaterhouse. It was an amazing experience, great training, worked with lots of different clients, different sizes, got to travel a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, and, and, and I, I, it was, it was a really difficult decision. Like I, I, I wrestled with it, but this is where the, my opportunistic brain kicked in again. I thought, I said, uh, you know, if I don't leave now, this feels like a good one. Nike's going to expand internationally. They want somebody to work in Latin America. It was a sure. really interesting job to me. Um, and I thought, you know, if I don't, if I don't take this one, you know, you keep going up in your career, price water, maybe you don't get another, maybe you don't get another chance. And frankly, if I, if, if I don't like it, I can, you I can, can fall back, back on my, yeah, on, my on my, on uh, my, right on my home base. So, so I did it and it was, uh, it was amazing. And, and, and it was about opportunity because Phil Knight was an accountant, uh, who founded the company. Uh, there was a lot of people at Nike who had finance and accounting backgrounds who were general managers, running offices, running countries. They weren't necessarily just in finance. And I felt like, well, besides it's a super cool company and I love their product and, sure. and, and the passion for sports, it was also about, Hey, it looks like, you know, if you're in finance and accounting at Nike, you're not just going to be in finance and accounting the rest of your career, which mm. is exactly what happened to me in the end. But I tried to, uh, tried to have a pretty opportunistic look. And if I stayed at Price Waterhouse, yeah, no, you're an accountant for the rest of your career yeah, that's at your Price Waterhouse. Right. I mean, that'd be great to be a partner, but you're a partner in a public accounting company. So it seemed a little bit. Again, seemed like a little bit more of a myopic point of view versus an opportunistic point of view. I lived in Seattle at the time, so uh-huh. I moved back to Portland and uh, and joined Nike. And so, and I've heard you. Uh, this is this theme of of choosing opportunity, but at some point for you, yeah, a passion for leadership, I would assume, has emerged. I mean, you you yep. lead giant teams now, yeah, and you have a pretty distinct leadership philosophy that I'd like to get into. But at what point in your development are you starting to think, yes, I'd like to lead an organization, to lead teams, to lead people, yeah. 
I, uh, probably three or four years into my Pricewaterhouse ex experience. I, okay. They asked me to move to Europe. Yep. One of those other ones. I had three kids at the time. Cooper, who just graduated from here, was just born. We moved to Europe when Cooper was four weeks old. Wow. And the other two were seven and eight. And I thought, geez, it seems a little... Four weeks. A little overwhelming, <laughs> a little intimidating to move to a foreign country because, you know, Spokane was the big city for most of my life. Right. Uh, so moving to Amsterdam seemed a little intimidating. Again, seemed like an unbelievable opportunity. When are you going to get asked to move overseas with your family? Yeah. May maybe never again in my life would I be able to do it. So we did it. Uh, and it was great. And it was during it, and it, and and it was during that phase that I had my last finance job. So like in that was in um, ninety eight, ninety nine. I was the finance director for Europe. I moved over there as a CFO for Europe. And while I was there, two years into it, they asked me to run the footwear business. Okay. And and that which was a great uh, leap of faith, I thought for Nike. Uh, again, for me too, a little bit S seemed a little bit daunting. Again mess that up, come back to finance, sure. do it well, opens doors of opportunities for your career. Let's do it. Uh, but it was during that transition where I, uh, I discovered may maybe some, um, some born with leadership traits that I was, that I had naturally. And I discovered that you can actually, you can, you can actually work on becoming a better leader. And I really enjoyed the leadership, which I, in my mind is very different than managing people. Right. Right. There's a, you know, I, I also want to be a great manager. I want people who work for me, who, who people would say, yes, I work for Eric. I want them to feel like I do a great job managing them. But I also really like leading the organization. People who don't report to you, but work in your group, look to you for leadership. You know, the CEO of, of any company is the one leader for everybody in that company, but he might only have, you know, like Mark is my boss, our CEO. He's got eight direct reports. I need him to be a great manager for me. The whole company needs him to be a great leader. Right. I, re I, I really like that. It's I, I think that's powerful, uh, positive, and really fulfilling uh, work. Just almost just as much as being known to be a good boss. Sure. No one, no one to being a good leader. I, I like that. So I, that's when, that's kind of when I learned, Hey, you know what? I, th I think I can have a bigger impact than just the handful of people that will report to me in whatever job I have. I think I, ha I could have a positive impact on a broader group of people yeah. who look to me for leadership. Okay. Cause kind that's of the, one, one thing I've thought about is sort of tracking your career is, you know, I, you present yourself as, as very down to earth, very humble, very grounded. But at some point, like you've achieved at the highest level, and yeah. <laughs> there's got to be moments in your career where you're like, "This could happen." And seizing opportunity is one of it, but also recognizing that, "Hey, I could make a contribution. I could lead this organization. Yep. I, you know, I, I can step up to this challenge and execute." Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a I'm a huge believer that the most of your opportunity comes to you. By doing a great job in the job you're in, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I, I'm not a big believer that you can kind of network your way into bigger and better jobs. You can network your way into different jobs, but I think being great at at, uh, at the job that you've been given is usually the the best measure of success. Yeah, pretty simple and, rule. And it, right, and being known uh, as somebody that people want to work with, mm -hmm. not have to work with. And so, if you can get those two things right, opportunity is probably going to come to you. And in a company like Nike. That is a growth company. We, you know, we we expand the business every year. We hire more and more people. We go into more and more categories, more and yep. more countries. That you know, you're going to have some opportunities, sure. which is kind of what happened. But yeah, I, I want everybody who works in in global operations. I want them to all think that they're well led. I want them to be proud that they work in that part of the company. I want them to be proud that they work for Nike. That uh -huh. they they believe in what Nike believes in. And I also want them to go, yeah, and I really like working in global ops. I think Eric provides good leadership. Sure. It's, a, it's an environment where I can do my best work. I'm not encumbered by biases or, or exclusion or anything like that. And that, that's the role of the leader, right? The leader right. sets an environment and determines what the values and the, the behaviors of the teams are. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I like that part of it. And, and along those lines, uh, and you raised this distinction a few minutes ago about the difference between a manager and a leader. Is there a difference between leading people versus leading an organization? You see what I'm getting yeah, at there? Yeah, I've been asked that before, actually, Justin, and I, I, I don't think so. Okay. I, I do believe there's a big difference between managing and leading. I think they're two very different skill sets. You can be really good at one and terrible at the other Yeah. in, in, in either order. And there's great examples of visionary leaders who were terrible people to work for mm -hmm. and unbelievably great people to work for who are terrible 
visionary leaders. Right. So at, at my level, you have to be really, really good at both. You sure. don't get to be the COO at Nike if you're not considered to be pretty good at both. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned that pretty early in my career, and I, and, I, and I work on both. I think it's a little easier to be a really good manager. Hey, you know, am I having staff meetings? Am I having one-on-ones? Do you know what's expected of you? Am I accessible? Do you have the right equipment and tools to do your job? Do we yeah. have a strategy? You know, those are the things you look to for your immediate supervisor. Leadership's a little more difficult. Leadership is creating, I, I define it as creating an environment where everybody, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, ability, size, shape, can show up in your organization as their authentic self and do their best work. And if they feel that way, then you're doing a good job as a leader. You're providing them the right tools and you're holding managers accountable for being good managers. That, that in a nutshell, that's kind of how I explain it. And and I think it's two, it's two different things. Yeah. How do you actually do that? Like, how do you, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Actually, you know what I mean? Like it sounds, and I'm not, I'm not sort of doubting it. The premise sounds fantastic, but how do you actually then go and execute on developing that place where people can do their best work? Yeah. Um, uh, a, a lot of it is the showing up. I say to the, I say to the leadership team that reports directly to me, I want you to find time to show up. I want you to find time to speak up and I want yeah. you to find time to shut up. Right hear others, encourage others to find their voice. Uh, and, and, and that's an over simplistic way to, no, to think about it, but, 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 you know, we're a global company. We do yeah. business in 190 countries and there's somebody in global operations in almost every single one of them. And, and you got to show up, you got to, you got to, if you can't show up personally, you got to show up on, on blogs, you got to show up on podcasts, you got to show up in, on videos, you got to show up with emails. Uh, you got to show up in person when you need to. I try to get to all the distribution centers. I try to get to the factories. I try to get to the to all of our uh, big uh, um, sourcing offices. I sure. think it's important to show up when you're the leader, not because any of those people report directly to me, but they're all in global operations. And then I try to, uh, to me, stand up um, uh, is important as well because I want I want people to be held accountable for mm. for their behavior for their actions. If they're not creating an environment and they're not being good managers and people aren't getting uh, a chance to be their best self and do their best work, well, I think the role of the leader is to acknowledge that and and press for changes and make difficult decisions and manage with courage and hold people accountable for being good to other people. Yeah. Much harder to do. Absolutely, and. and you know, I've heard this, I've heard you speak on this topic before, this notion of, uh, you, you know, a lot of, uh, Nike's got this, it's, it's a company about sport, company about athletics, obviously hire a lot of athletes, yep. athletes are competitors. Yeah. You know, how do you balance this internal versus external competition? I've heard you talk about the internal competition. It's, yep. you know, people are pretty much on board the same team and you're trying to beat the other guys, but you're not trying to beat each other. Right. Yeah. Most of the time. Most of the time. It, it can happen. You know, the, the headlines in our company the last several right. weeks right. would indicate that that behavior sometimes finds its way in the, in the broader pockets of the organization than we'd like. But I th also think we're taking the courageous steps, not because we were sued, not because we there was a story written about us, but because we said, hey, you know what? We don't like the way certain of our leaders are showing up and treating yeah other p folks in the company. And I'm not sure that those people feel like they can show up and do their best work. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case as the leaders in the company, you owe it to those, to the organization to make changes so that, that you can do that. So we're, we're, we're living that journey literally right now. And if, and, and, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta read the headlines. They're not Absolutely. all, they're not all, they're not all pleasant. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we have a really motivated and optimistic workforce because of it. Hey, you guys are going to hold people accountable. Yeah. I didn't think you cared. I didn't think you guys even knew at the top level that this is how certain parts of the company were operating. So you do, it's, that's empowering and, and positive for a huge part of the organization. Yeah, so. these, these kind of watershed moments are just such great test pieces for right. how are you going to respond in that moment. And thinking about, I mean, that's one thing, we're going through a tough time here at the university. Without and, a doubt. And there's going to be changes. And what sometimes, and this is probably going to be an unpopular thing to say, but what sometimes gets ignored in this discussion is what it will the institution be like for the people that are here after all this yeah. change happens? Yep. It's important to think about that. And so thinking about this, hey, if, if this institution, Nike, stands up for accountability, that has a lot of 
yep. potentially positive implications in the long run. That's right. That That's leadership yeah. uh, way more than it is management, right? That's leadership of the company saying, hey, we don't accept this. A little different dynamic here. But but to get through the change on this campus, Seth and and the staff have to have great leadership and, and make pe- – change is never pleasant, right? It can be extraordinarily difficult uh, – for many, many people and yep. can be really exciting for others, but it's, but it's not exciting for everybody. True. It takes really good leadership. I, I, I believe in Seth. I think that's why we hired him. Uh, but, but it's good. It's, it's going to be a heavy lift and you have to believe that, that what is to come is better than what we have now. And, and you have to trust and have confidence in that leadership. If you don't, this is going to be a very, very painful process. Yeah. Yeah, cracks start to emerge pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. I think you know, one one I had a conversation with Seth in the on the podcast earlier in the semester, and one thing you know I asked him about, I'd like to get your thoughts on, was this distinction between people and structure. You know, if you try yep. to change an organization or 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 drive an organization toward a performance orientation. What's more important, getting the right people in the place or, or <laughs> creating the structure? I'm sure it's probably a bit of both, but yeah. what's your thought on that? Uh, so the left-brainer in me, um, early in my career, approached these types of change and transitions by trying to start out, start out with the, the boxes and the lines of the org chart. What is what is the org chart that I think we need yeah. to drive this this new um, vision or the new, the new strategy? And then... What talent do I have, and and who would be best in the boxes? What when I uh, midway through my career, I I, um, I got the opportunity for a dozen years. I uh, I managed and led the design, innovation, product marketing, wow. engineering functions at Nike, which is frankly somewhat shocking for the accounting degree kid from the University of Montana because you know Nike's generally considered one of the best product companies in the yeah. world, and that was my job for the company. And and that not everybody on the creative process thinks like I do. They're not all left brainer, shall we say? As a matter of fact, most of them are the other, if not, and and certainly more balanced. And that the, the way to motivate them, the way to lead them through change, the way to um, inspire them and get them to come on board to believe that that where we're going is better than where we are. And the, your, their leader is the kid from the University of Montana with an accounting degree. Yeah, like yeah. really. Uh, is to start with what is the best talent? What is the talent that you have? And how best do you organize the talent to get mm-hmm. to the future state? And once I start, so you, you said this yourself in the question, it's probably a little bit of both. Fit, to me, 50-50. We, when when we're, we're trying to digitally transform Nike right now for yep. speed, it's a big part of my job is to take the value um, chain and, and try to figure out where and at how, with how much money and at what pace are we going to digitally transform the company from start to finish, and uh, and and th- that that process is not that that will, that will that will take some time, but it's going to have to, it will require a balance of okay wh- who are our most talented people, and how best do we get the most out of them, and balance with yeah we got to, we're gonna, we can't operate the same way we can't be organized the same way we can't have the same processes we we have. So what what's what's the other balance of that? Typically, that's how we get to the best answer. Uh, but for a long time in my career, I was the 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 org chart. Start yeah. with the org chart, then kind of okay, who's the list of our talent? What are their levels? How do we, and, and kind of you start to kind of try to match them up. It's right. ju- it's just it's not good enough, right? There's there's and and frankly, the millennial generation isn't going to let us get away with it. That's not they want they want to have multiple careers. They want tons of opportunity. I want them to feel like they can do all of that in our company. I want them to feel like they can have many careers, just all of them at Nike. And to do that, you, you don't just start with, you know, org charts. You got to start with, okay, hey, what do you want out of your career? What, what yeah. what's your, what are you passionate about? What, what, what's, what, what are the gaps in your development? What sure. would you like to be doing? Start with the talent, of the talent, and try to go. Okay, well, knowing Justin is one of the most talented, high potential people we have. This is what he would like. This is what we're, we think he would be happy and uh, developing but maybe that maybe it's a compl- it's a job you don't even have today right maybe it's maybe you think differently about the organization because of that I, that's a good mix i like that but thinking about that it kind of goes back to you know your core theme of empowering people to do their best work i don't know yep. if i botched the quote or, or yeah. whatever but yep. but you know as you're sort of it makes sense that it's 50-50 because you know you got to create the right structure 
right? But you also have to not only empower people, but people need to see that you care about empowering them. And That's you're right. Spending time asking them what their aspirations are, yep. how they can fit in, and so trying to work both sides of that coin at the same time seems yep spot on. Yes, doesn't it's not it's not a perfect world. No, it's not fifty fifty, yeah. but uh, but I think it's a better place to start from both ends to get to the middle than to just say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna org like this. Now, who do we have? Or, hey, here's our smartest people. Let's let them kind of work how they want to work. Yeah. That's not, that, that, you know, organized chaos in corporate America, not all that uh, effective of uh, org discipline. So a little bit of both. Right, right. So, you know, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We got to get you across campus for yeah. some graduation rehearsal. <laughs> but I do want to kind of bring the lens back to University of Montana and yeah. students here and kind of your advice for – Somebody you know, starting out in their accounting degree or, or stat- starting out in an English class or whatever it is. Like yep. How would you yeah, – I know you said, hey, look for the greatest opportunities. Yeah. How would you advise students to kind of conceptualize the world in front of them at this point? Uh, I, I, I kind of stay with that theme. I talk to a, I talk to a ton of students, right, at, yeah. uh, at this institution and, and at a handful of others. And when you're, when you're first starting – you're, I don't, I think the aperture for most students is already starting to close in their own mind. And, and that, well, there's a lot of pressures that, that encourage you to right. do that too. It, yeah, there is. There's forces that take a major, get an interview. Right. And some of it comes from your parents who are yep. paying for your education. Some of it comes from, from faculty and staff. Some of it comes for friends because your, you, your friend is going to be in nursing and they're like, what are right. you going to do? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's perfectly okay. Not to know. At some point, the aperture will start to close, but I, I, I want I want the aperture for all of us to be as wide open as it can, personally and professionally, for as long as it can. Yeah. Now, because because they'll, it'll get it'll it'll start to shrink for each of us differently. When I'm talking to students who are like juniors and seniors, I think that they get they get inordinately concerned about what's the job I'm going to take, mm-hmm. who am I going to work for. I really like that person. Oh, I really like that company. And I want them to start. Yes, all, all important. But what's really important is where do you think you're going to create the most opportunities for yourself? Because what I can guarantee you is your career probably isn't going to go the way you're, you're thinking about it in your head. Of course not. You'll probably have more jobs. You might work for more companies. You might live in different cities. And so it's it, almost impossible to kind of plan, I hope, for most people. And so take the job where you think, you know what? I'm, I, if I think two or three moves ahead in my career and I have and I ha- and I have the luxury of choice take the one where you where you think it's going to create or lead to the most opportunity might not be the best job title might not even be the best money initially mm-hmm. might not be the you know you know you might have to work for somebody who you think would not be as good to work for as this other person you met in an interview process you put all that kind of on the back shelf and go, okay, which of these do I think is going to create the most opportunity for me in my own development and in my career? Take that job. Yeah. That, and that's, that's the advice I got, frankly, from, from professors in the school of business mm-hmm. and my father at the time, uh, which is why I'm kind of, I'm kind of biased towards it. And frankly, I'm a, I'm, I'm a walking exhibit Absolutely. of, of what can happen. Uh, so that I, I I I tell t- students that a lot. They're like, "Oh, that makes a lot of sense." Yeah, let's let's see if you got the courage to really choose yeah. opportunity over job, title, paycheck, boss, company name. Oh, I really want to work for one of these companies. It's an amazing company. Yeah, maybe the maybe working in a regional company, maybe working someplace in Missoula sure. might be better, more opportunistic. So at least put it into into the decision tree. Uh, when you're when you're going to move from student to employee or professor or whatever you're going to do in life, sure. It's, it seems like when you're thinking about this notion of opportunity, you probably need to have some kind of north star, if you will. Like whether that's if you want to lead people or or an organization yep. or whatever. So uh, yeah, you gotta have you gotta have shape. dreams and yeah, hopes, exactly. right? Like I'd love to be the CFO of a Fortune 500 company, or right. I'd love to be the CEO of a company someday, no matter what the size is, because I'd like to run the whole thing, or or I'd, I'd love to work in Europe, or I mean, I mean, it can you gotta? It's a fairly good point. Uh, not a fairly good point. It's a very good point. 
that, yeah, you, you still have to have hopes and aspirations and dreams. You don't yeah. want to just kind of like merrily go about the the career development one decision at a time. Uh, yeah, but this notion of focus is important. Like you don't want to get too focused. No. Nope. You want to maintain a notion of your, your hopes and dreams, but also, ha- like you said, having the courage to maybe walk away from what could be a slam dunk to – you know, hey, hey, this oper- this this could be this could open up more doors in yep. the long run, and being able to kind of have the foresight there. Yep, um, I, I think I, I I see in my own kids. My my oldest daughter's thirty one. Uh, she's the oldest of five in the blended family. I, I watch them go through this process. I try to give them as much parenting advice as they'll take at thirty years old. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you, you know, you're not married to the decisions you make for the rest of your life. You can undo decisions. I just think it's, it's a good filter to have when you're, when you're building your career and you're still developing yourself. And because frankly, it's like literally anything can happen. It, it, I'm, I'm pretty good walking proof of that. And the other thing I tell my kids all the time is get, you find what grounds you, right? So okay. the other big role that this university plays for me and the city is keeps me grounded. For you, sure. you, you said, Hey, I have a pretty good reputation for being humble and, yeah, because frankly, the city wouldn't let you wouldn't let you get away with anything else. <laughs> That's right? for sure. I'm not gonna, you can't come back to the University of Montana and be a big timer. I'm not going to show up with my friends and let you know start to talk about what, how cool it is to be the CEO at Nike because they don't give a crap. Right, right. I love that. They just care about you. I, I, that's right. I, I love that. That you get that here at this school with with this faculty, and you get it in this community. That's been super super helpful to me in my career. Yeah. Well, Eric, that's a great way to end this conversation. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, you bet. I enjoyed it. And just thanks for all that you give to the University of Montana. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for all that you do as well. All right, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric as much as I do. It was it was a real honor to get on his calendar during his time here, and we thank him for his generosity to to the podcast, but more broadly to this institution and to this community. Okay, coming up next week, we have a special episode on funding for higher education and the value of higher education, particularly here in the state of Montana. As many of you know, the uh, the November election features a public referendum called the Six Mill Levy. The Six Mill Levy is a ballot initiative that comes up every 10 years. Uh, it's been on the ballot every 10 years since 1948, and it's passed every time. And what it funds is higher education, the Montana University system. So a critical chunk of funding here for the University of Montana and other universities in the system. Obviously, something uh, important and salient to this community. Um, Sure, I have a dog in this fight, but I want to be clear that from my position here on this podcast, I'm not trying to sway votes one way or the other. What I'm trying to do is get people aware of the issue and to advocate that you get out there and vote. Okay. So what are we doing to educate you about the six mil levy and and higher education? I brought in uh, Senator John Tester and Congressman Greg Gianforte to give their perspectives on higher education in this state and how it can help us prepare leaders for the future. And then we wrap it up with some perspectives from Bryce Ward. You remember Bryce Ward, economist with the Bureau of Business and Economic Research. He was our, he's actually our first return guest. So excited to have Bryce back to give some of his perspective on the words from our elected officials and also give us some of the data on higher education funding in this state. Anyway, stay tuned for that. We were looking forward to it. Remember that a new angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in Missoula, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out www.cedcareers.com. Moving forward, if you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things with creativity and hustle, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. First, rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the show. Second, write a review. The more reviews we get, and hopefully positive ones, the more we can grow. And third, please just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship opportunities, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash anewangle. There you will also find a link to support the pod. 
Before we go, I'd like to thank a few people for making this project happen. First of all, Elizabeth Willey, Communications Director here at the University of Montana College of Business. I'd also like to thank recent UM graduate Michelle DeFluke and our fabulous interns Savannah Sletton and Max Gibson. And a special thanks to VTO for providing the show with music. Finally, thanks to my producer, Stefan Borson. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time.